Let's do this. The Cult of Hockey podcast by the faithful and for the faithful. I'm David Staples of the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here tonight with Bruce McCurdy. Hey, Bruce. Hey, David. How are you doing tonight? Good, good, good. Had a very busy day at work. And then um, here we go. Big Oilers game and a big win, Bruce. This was a big win. 4-3 in overtime against the Winnipeg Jets. A very hard-fought game tactical game um some breakdowns from both teams that's what's going to happen when you have some really great offensive players these are two really good hockey teams this could be this could be the western conference final winnipeg and edmonton um i mean of course there's hell no there's like eight teams that could get there now that the predators are playing better um bruce this is our two good things two bad things and two numbers podcast what is your good thing? Well, I'm going to have to go with the penalty kill, David. After ripping them on Sunday for allowing three goals in two minutes and 38 seconds, tonight it was a tidy zero goals in eight minutes and 18 seconds, uh, and only two shots that the PK unit allowed in all his uh, uh, power plays. Uh and they came through with a, a couple of real turning point penalty kills. Uh, they killed shortly after taking the 2-1 lead. Uh, Connor Brown, who just scored, took a high-sticking double minor and for drawing a bead of drop fake, out of blood. Fake blood, yeah. From Yeah, yeah. I think the guy found ketchup in his, mustard, in his mustache from his supper. I haven't seen trickery like that for <laughs> since Stampede Wrestling. <laughs> and I, I was remembering back to Evander Kane on the bench last week, spitting out blood and spitting mad that there was only a two-minute penalty called. Anyway, that evened up a little bit later. But they killed off that four-minuter without a shot. And then the coup de grace, which could have been the coup de grace on an absolutely dreadful road trip, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this later, uh, but the uh, atrocious penalty called on Ryan Nugent Hopkins with 2.06 to go in a tie game in regulation. This on the heels of a game where they just lost the game in the dying minutes of regulation that was tied on a penalty kill fail. Well, this penalty kill did not fail. And they dug in, they uh, rolled up their sleeves and got down to business. And uh, they played hard. They played physical on the puck. And they uh, uh, were played with some real desperation the penalty kill and yet they didn't run around you know they just won puck battles and they they cleared it out and they boxed out and uh i thought uh, uh a fine uh, performance by that group and a huge back bounce back game after they were really the the achilles heel of edmonton in the in the prior game and what do we got vinnie de 442 cody cc 338 T.S. Ekholm, 351. Darnell, uh, Brett Kulak, 313 on the on the Nurse penalty. Nurse had a penalty, right? So Nurse had, yeah, well, that's... Yeah, that and he was in the... Tough. I think he was in the penalty box and missed another one of the kills. Yeah, he had a So, he in had fact, a fight, he missed the four-minute. Right? He missed the four-minute kill, didn't he? Because yeah, he'd he had fight? a fight just he before that. He stood up for Corey Perry. Corey Perry. Who that's was right. Getting, yeah, yeah. I didn't mind that. Um and among the forwards, it was Janmark, three minutes. Uh, uh, Henrik, who I thought had a really good game tonight, uh, 250. Uh, and just right around two minutes each for McLeod, Fogel, and Ryan. Uh, and so those were the those were the the water bearers on the uh, on the penalty kill for the Oilers tonight. And uh, Shout out to them after ripping them last game. So, uh, sew them back together. This one. They let in just the two shots, and only one of them was a grade A shot. But it, man, was it ever a fantastic shot! That's a Shifley on the cross ice pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah that was a great save. I thought, I thought we were getting the same old, same old. Because Der- on that play, mm-hmm. Derek Ryan had been in the corner, and he was like battling hard in the corner. Mm-hmm. But he, you know, I don't think he should be there. <laughs> You got to stop that crossing pass. And the orders, I think, have been overcommitting. 
when they when they get over aggressive, that's when they get in trouble. And on that yeah. play, that's exactly what happened because he, he was the main culprit in allowing that cross. Right. He went too deep in the corner. Yeah. They sh- they shut it right down after that. They they didn't allow another great A shot on the power play, and including on that four minute power play. So that was an outstanding effort by them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Bruce, my uh, good thing is Connor Brown's first meaningful goal of the season. And uh, the game was tied at one at that point, Leon Dreisaitl, on a fantastic passing play. Beautiful stretch pass from Bouchard, setting up uh, McDavid, who put it to Fogel, to put it to Dreisaitl. They had tied it up. And then um, about a minute and a half later, um, Connor Brown steams into the slot um, on a rush. Uh, where uh, CC had kicked it all off with a nice stretch pass to Ekholm. Ekholm setting up Brown. Brown went hard into the slot and ripped a hard shot right past the goalie with Derek Ryan uh, providing a little bit of confusion and distraction in front of the net. It was a fantastic shot. And uh, his other goals, I think they've been up like three, four goals when, when he scored. Four so goal this... leads in both cases four. to make ten to five goal leads on so... tap-ins. So a huge goal, and is this ever great to see? Like, do they ever need to see him score? Otherwise, he can't mm-hmm. justify his, his place yeah. in the lineup. He really can't in the playoffs. And it's his third goal in six games. He's Bruce. He's he's uh, since scoring. Up. He's yeah, goal every second <laughs> game, man. He's like a forty goal pace here. Yeah, right. So <laughs> and when simplest. you say he ripped it by the goalie, he ripped it by the goalie, Connor Hellebuck. You know, one of the one of the. Um, fairly most years as a trophy candidate mm-hmm. uh, that, uh, you know, was a pretty hard guy to beat. And he certainly was tonight. Uh, but Brown beat him clean from the slot. Wicked shot. I did yeah. not know he could shoot like that. Yeah. Well, he's, he must be able to shoot because he scored 20 goals a couple times, I guess, yep, in the NHL. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think as he's getting stronger in his legs, uh, he, his shot he's is getting better. It. Yeah, he's he's just incrementally getting a wee fat bit faster, shooting a bit harder. It's coming along coming along slowly, and finally he's close to his former self as a player. Hey, if he gets there by the playoffs, Bruce, like maybe this will work out in the end, and we all won't all be bitter and having to hear people complain about it endlessly over the summer. Um, Bruce, my. Uh, we're going to reverse order on the bad things. I'll go first because mine comes first. It's it's now Nooch had a, uh, obviously a huge goal in the third period, and um, he helped set up the the winning goal, charging the puck up the ice and then going hard to the net, opening up space for Zach Hyman. Just a, a great offensive play by Ryan Nugent Hopkins on the winning goal. Mm-hmm. But he had two plays actually early in the game, which were just like head scratchers on the on the defense. The first comes late in the first period, and um, he I think this is one where he sh- had shot the puck at net, got a really good shot at net, and then watched it. Mm-hmm. And as he was watching it, the other team broke out three on two, mm-hmm. and they got a breakaway. Uh, yeah. They got a break in chance by Monahan, I believe it was late in the first, uh, because he was admiring a shot, just, a you know, and it was just a microsecond too long. It wasn't, it wasn't flagrant or anything, but in the NHL today, you got to be on it, especially against these good teams, because they will punish you for a moment's inattention or for the wrong call yep. in a moment. And that's what happened there. Um, then on the goal, um, this was another, um, three on two rush. And uh, I'm just trying to think um, what happened on that. What happened on the goal, Bruce? I'm just, uh, I just finished running the game grades. Oh, so. right. Uh, yeah, it was a, uh, uh, it was a counterattack. And both Nuge and Hyman were a little bit late coming back. And it was, it was almost a nothing play. Like a, a guy made an outside sort of fairly weak shot. Uh, that got through uh, CC that allowed the outside shot. And then Big Lowry got a, a piece of it in front, tipped it. And uh, and then the rebound popped out to the side. And Appleton, was it, that slammed it in? Yeah. So so what happened on... neither yeah. forward came back all the way to the net, which they needed to do on that particular play. 
what happened on this one was it was a three on three rush, but Nugent Hopkins was just, and again, this was just momentary. He did a little bit of puck watching and he went to the puck, to the puck carrier, which is Lowry. He, Lowry's already covered, or was it Con- well, I thought that was Kyle Connor who shot the that. The guy who shot. shot it from outside was, oh, Lowry shot it and Connor tipped it. Was that what it was? I anyway, thought it was, yeah, yeah I, I thought it was Connor, Connor who first shot assist. it. Anyway, th- there, was a, there was a Winnipeg the I player carrying. Lowry tipped it myself. Yeah, Lowry tipped it, Connor shot With the initial nine shot. nine foot reach. Kyle Connor. Anyway, so Nuge is watching the, um, Nuge is watching the, the, the puck carrier, the guy who's shooting it. CeCe's already on him. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. the danger man, Appleton, is sneaking into the play. That's Nuge's man. He's the third yeah. guy. He's got to be looking for that that guy creeping into the slot, and he's not. He's watching the puck carrier moving towards him. And that's why Appleton is just wide open on the rebound from the tip shot from a nine-foot armed Lowry. That Lowry is a f- force against the Oilers consistently. Mm-hmm. He's a good hockey player. So that's why, yeah. So he's a Nugent good defensive Cup. player, and he's a huge guy and a face-off guy, and he yeah. always seems to chip in. Key, like his stats don't look like anything, but he always seems to be involved in key goals. Against the Oilers, at least. Against the Oilers, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, two two pretty major defensive mistakes by Nugent. I agree that that was a nothing play, but it became something because of a just a momentary lapse in concentration by one of the forwards, which is not <laughs> uncommon on um, five alarm shots. Like, and goals against in the NHL. I mean, um, the you, forwards often get it wrong. It's not easy to get it right. Bruce, yes. you're a bad thing. Yeah, <clears throat> it's actually two bad things sort of right in a row, the two Californians that uh, Winnipeg scored in third. <clears throat> and Edmonton, they'd had a, a four-minute power play. Each team got a four-minute power play in this one, and the order scored on the first one, Nuge. Finally got off the schneid on a, what I, I called it a give and go. He dumped the puck into his own defensive corner for McDavid. And then McDavid basically carried it 200 feet up the ice. And Nuge just sort of went into stealth mode and materialized on the far side. And this time no one picked him up. And he was able to slam it home to break a lengthy drought. 13 games since his last. Uh, and then at, at that point, it's 3-1. They're halfway through the third, and I'm thinking, come on, just, you know, one w- w- one rotation of the four lines, nothing bad happening, and, and this one's in really good shape. Well, they didn't make it through the four lines without two bad things happening. <clears throat> and the first one was just pressure, pressure. They orders couldn't get it out, couldn't get it out. McDavid tipped one that could have gone out if it hadn't just had tipped directly to the guy on the point who was able to keep it in and they passed it around and the outside shot came it was kind of a one-timer but it was it wasn't even a hard shot like there was a knuckle puck and the puck was like two feet in the air and it just dropped right down and hit the post on the way in and skinner never saw a thing because big min was right in the line of fire so all he saw was big 73 and not much of that puck, I don't think. So yeah. it's not n- normally what we call a grade A shot in terms of where it was taken from. But if the goalie can't see it, that changes the equation. Yeah. And then, so it's 3-2 and not for long, because on the very next shift, uh, you know, the puck goes right back into Edmonton's zone. And it's some back and forth. And then finally the orders get control. And then Cody Cece, I think it was, <clears throat> chipped it out of the zone. And it just looked like a safe pass into the neutral zone. The damn thing carried all the way to the icing line for icing. And the guys who were peeling for the bench wound up having to come back out, take the draw, lose the draw, and jet cycle around, take another outside shot. And this time it is uh, Sean Monahan, who's kind of left alone in the mid slot. And he deflects the puck right out of midair and into the net. And just like that, it's gone in literally one minute, two goals. It's gone from 3-1 to a tie game. And Oilers have blown a 3-1 lead for the second game in a row. Which did not land well in my living room, I have to say. <laughs> I love Californians when the Oilers score them, but otherwise I tend to not. 
they're the most frustrating goals <laughs> against. Like they just they come out of nowhere. They're mm -hmm. they're there's a good deal of randomness in yeah, them. Yes, absolutely. There really is. Like the, what separates yeah. a Californian from a one that doesn't go in the oh. net is luck often. I mean, that yeah, was Brandon a hell of a Dillon. tip shot. That was a hell of a tip shot by um Brendan Dillon scores. Exactly. You know, I mean, yeah. So and it was just DeHarnay's like DeHarnay's punching himself in the head essentially after that one when he was, he was on the left side. I noticed he tends to maybe get lost a little bit more when he's on when he flips and he's on his opposite side. He, he seems to have his angles pretty good on the on the strong side. Uh -huh. And that one the D man kind of got crossed over and anyway he was unable to block the shot but was very able to block the vision of his goalie. Not a good yeah. combination. They had been putting quite a bit of pressure on, I think. They'd already mm -hmm. had. Um, yeah, yeah, that was a long shift. And it went, seemed like as soon as the penalty ended, it went right into Edmonton's zone and they just couldn't get it out. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the second one, that was, a, that was a hell of a tip, actually. So what can you say? That was a tough one. There's there's little, you, I mean, Nurse is there, yeah. right? But it's tough. Yeah, to, a little too far away from the guy to yeah. close the gap. Okay, Bruce, let's move on to our numbers. What is your number? Yeah, I'm going to go with 200. That is the 200th career goal by Zach Hyman, who finishes a spectacular week, uh, which he scored two goals on Thursday, one on Saturday, one on Sunday, and an overtime game winner on Tuesday to roar past the 50-goal mark and now to the 200th career goal mark in uh, uh surprisingly rapid fashion given you know he's an eight year nine year veteran uh that uh well eight and eight eight and a part year veteran that started the year at 149 and here he is all the way up to uh, uh to 200 and done in quite dramatic st fashion he, he'd been absolutely robbed by hell of a early in the game on a rebound chance where it looked like he went right around him. I don't know how how uh, Book was able to get his pad over and just kick that one out. But in overtime, he and uh, uh, well, he, he had a very short shift because Dreisaitl came when Newton Hopkins got the puck and came rushing up the ice. Dreisaitl went to the bench and Hyman hopped over the boards and joined the rush that was already sort of gaining the zone. And Newton Hopkins made a really good play to to uh, get him the puck and Hyman cut into the middle and fired a backhand shot and then pounced on his own rebound and pounded it in for the game winner in overtime. I'll tell you what, Bruce, if Zach, if the Oilers win the cup and Zach Hyman has a great playoff uh -huh. and he lasts a few more years here in Edmonton with McDavid, uh -huh. he could be in the Hall of Fame before this is all over. It's, it's It wouldn't be uh, unheard of that that could happen. Um, he Long way from a, 200. To, I mean, the the crew he'd have numbers, to get to 400. Yeah, but he'd that's, have to not, get to four, that's not That's not impossible in the present dynamic. Yeah, he's in a very good spot. And a lot have for, to go right for a lot for, for all the shit that Zach Hyman's been taking in recent days from jealous uh, fans of other teams. One put a, put together a video and claimed that any goal scored from within five feet of the net was wait for it unethical. And he compared how many unethical goals Hyman had compared to ethical goals. So I don't know if this one tonight counted as ethical or unethical, because the whole reason the puck was close to the net was because of the play Hyman made to get it there. Anyway, uh, yeah. Uh, there's, yeah, there's been some real weird commentary out what, there. What blog was that on? Do you Hyman's know? 50, 50th goal. Uh, it was actually uh, just a, um, a tweet on the internet yesterday. Oh, Somebody sh sh There was a video of all 50 goals and this guy ran a little counter in the corner, ethical, unethical. Oh, he it was a tap a video. In. If it was a tap in, it was unethical. Very weird choice of words. So... What an idiot. And then another guy I today had all that hard work, though. That's a lot of hard work to put that video together. Like good four minute rant that the guy had on the net on saying that Hyman had had it easy because his dad was rich and he was able to buy a league and and give him every chance <clears throat> that he needed, neglecting oh, to mention that when 
Hyman was a peewee. He was about the 12th best player on this team, and yet somehow he made it to the NHL and made it to the 50 goal. Uh, Mark, I mean, it's a pretty exceptional story, if you ask me. Uh, uh, anyway, there was uh, there was some very weird some people commentary Bruce, out there. Some people, but, Bruce, can't help but display their mental illness on the internet, and uh, that's just insanity. Or cantankerousness like, or whatever. Well, it's that's toxic envy. Like, yeah. just get lost, buddy. Yeah. Anyway, he took a lot of grief. Even the L.A. Kings fan lowered the boom. On the L.A. Kings, sorry, the L.A. Kings official Twitter feed, which should have no reason to like Zach Hyman, but they just lowered the boom on this guy because they just thought it was, uh, well, maybe they thought it was unethical. Was it the unethical guy or the other guy, the envious guy? That they yeah, it was the boom? envious guy. Mr. Envy. Who, who got it. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm listening to this and I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. Uh, like no other NHLers had a rich dad or any kind of advantages, right? Like Keith and, or sorry, Matt and Brady Kachuk that are hanging around NHL dressing rooms from the age of three, you know, they never had any inside track or, you know, any of the many, many sons of uh, former NHLers that have all kinds of access from early age. You know, it's uh, unfortunate. I mean, there's, there's, uh, this is itself a bit of a conundrum. It's a rich family sport in the sense that you've got to have money to support your kid to play in this sport. So oh, you Zach have to have Zach Hyman is not uh, yeah. hardly alone, but his dad is, you know, he's a rich dude. But uh, Curtis Hamilton's dad was a rich dude too, owned a team. And Curtis Hamilton didn't score 50 goals in the NHL. In fact, he didn't score any. I mean, Zach Hyman had whatever extra gears it took to keep working on and raising his game. And I'll say one thing about Zach Hyman's super ability that he doesn't get much credit for is he is a fantastic complimentary player. He's great without the puck. He knows where to go. He creates havoc. He creates lanes. He creates screens, creates rebounds. He pots rebounds, you know, and he's quite happy to let the, the high skill guys do most of the puck handling and he's a great support player. And just look at all the wingers McDavid had. What other winger had 50 with McDavid? We can't count dry side, I don't think. So who had 40? Who had 30? 27, Patrick Maroon. Well, would you highest. count Nuge? Uh, not really as McDavid's winger for the whole year. I'd have to check and see what their yeah, splits were. Check. But uh, yeah, anyway. And I'm not are... sure that you count Nuge either, Bruce. I don't know. Yeah, I still think of Nuge and Drysdale as centers, not wingers. Anyway, he's uh, he's uh, Chris Kunitz to Sidney Crosby in terms of what he does for his line. He's just an excellent mortar player you know in the bricks and mortar arrangement and sometimes those players don't get all the credit they they deserve and other times apparently they get too much credit yeah him scoring 50 goals really seemed to set people off i, I just was honestly i just ignored it all i don't care what like who cares like i don't care what all these people have to say like you know there's just so many ridiculous opinions out there so 200 nice. goals you don't do that by uh because daddy's rich yeah <laughs> you know it, there, it's true hockey is becoming a rich person sport and it takes a lot and just it, it takes a ton like there's tons of people like from talking to parents if you ask them why 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 is you're not your kid in hockey part of it is is the money and part of it like they say i don't want to get up at 7 a.m so there's like you have to have super committed parents too, mm -hmm. like yes, five a.m. for hockey or practice is not practice. unusual. You know it, Bruce. You were there. I do. Twelve and, years. Yeah, I had five kids in minor hockey, <laughs> and I coached for ten years. Yeah. It's 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 a, it's not for everybody, um, but the people in it um, love it. And the kids, generally speaking, <laughs> put up with their fanatical parents, and they also have a good time. Um, yeah. Anyway, Bruce, my number is um, Darnell Nurse's stat line, which is kind of unusual. And I'll start with his unofficial stat line compiled by the Cult of Hockey. He, 
he had six major contributions to grade A shots at even strength, and he made four major mistakes on grade A shots against. So that's a high event, Darnell Nursian kind of game, but more good than bad. And that's what you're at his best. That's that's what you're going to get from Darnell Nurse. More mm-hmm. good from from bad. Yeah. And that's that was a that's pretty good for for him in that game. Um, he ended up minus one. Uh, but he, so seven minutes in penalties for that fight and good for him for standing up for Corey Perry. I actually think that's important. Oh. You know, during the decade dar- of darkness, we remarked on it numerous times, how no one stood up for Taylor Hall, Jordan Everly, Ryan Nugent Hopkins when they got run. And he, here we have it. Here we have a team that does that. When Corey Perry, um, gets drilled into the bench by Brendan Dillon, Darnell Nurse is there for him. And I, and I do think that makes a huge difference on a team mm-hmm. given the violent, intense nature of hockey, intimidating nature of playing in the NHL. Well, Perry had been drilled into the corner in no uncertain terms, has been sort of thrown into the glass by huge lumbering Morgan Stanley in the first period. And yeah. Perry fought his own battle there and lost it. Like that was quite a one-sided fight. And the linesman was standing off to the side watching Stanley rain down blows and going, well, what do we say to Corey? I guess... Hell with you, Corey. Take a few more while we watch. How is that guy's nickname? <laughs> how is that guy's nickname not Mount Logan Stanley? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, really. He, Corey, yeah. Corey so, Perry was just trying to to survive that fight, Bruce. I don't think he oh, even yeah. lost it because he didn't get hit that hard. Took he he was just he was just trying to get as far away rope, from those long f- arms. Rope yeah, rope. well, not rope, but yeah, kind of. <laughs> Yeah, I just dodged the punches that were coming, tire uh-huh. out Stanley, and hoped that finally the linesman would come to his rescue. Yeah. yeah, well, the second time that, you know, he got taken into the uh, into the bench uh, by Brendan Dillon, who's a bit, another big, lumbering, sort of crude defenseman that Winnipeg has on the left side. And uh, the hit was okay. And then after Perry sort of got pushed back on the ice, uh, Dillon decided to just give him another little shot just for good measure. And that's what Darnell objected to, and up he came. Thought because Perry, he can't fight for a second time. He's probably too tired anyway. But those fights really wear you out. So, oh my goodness, Darnell wow. took took that one. And I think that that's a that's a good good statement to Corey Perry that you know you're going to fight a lot of battles for us, but we're going to have your back from you know when you really need it. And that was a time where I think it was appropriate to. So you're going to push Corey Perry around, not on not on my watch, was basically what what Nurse was saying there. And uh, I think in the fight too with Nurse, he was also trying. Like I think both of them were fairly cautious in the in their fights. Like they don't want to break their hands on some knucklehead's helmet. So um, he knocked he knocked Dylan's helmet clean off with the last <laughs> punch. So I know it must have landed somewhere in the area. I'm not quite sure if he. Anyway, it was. Uh, it was uh, spirited, but as you say, a little bit cautious. But it was more a question of answering the bell because Winnipeg played a, a hard edge game tonight, and Evan had to answer that challenge. Yeah, the um, so Nurse is continuing with Nurse's stat line. Um, mm-hmm. His ice time was just 1931. And in fact, in a game, the top defenseman was 21 21. So there was yeah. fairly even distribution of ice time for the defenseman and the forwards in this game. Um, he um, he tied for the lead, Nurse did, in shots with six at net, with Hyman, who also had six, and Evander Kane, who had six, including his mm-hmm. breakaway chance. His breakaway chance set up by Darnell Nurse's fantastic Great stretch pass. pass. Yeah. Um, Darnell Nurse led the orders with five hits. This is the game the orders need from Darnell Nurse, uh, this high-energy game where he's hitting, shooting, fighting, making passes, and hopefully, hopefully, you know, limiting the defensive mistakes as much as possible. Uh, although there's always going to be a few because he's playing mm-hmm. a, a fast-paced game against tough competition. Well, he sure made a big defensive play with maybe three or four minutes left when there was a a, pa- a seam pass that looked like it was going to find Mark Shifley with nothing but net to look at. And uh, Darnell was able to just get a little piece of it, the pass coming through and deflect it, not on his own net, but away from uh, Shifley and just into the gap. And it was just the slightest little touch, and it may well have been a game saver. That was a very deadly-looking play. 
He also he uh, on the four minute power play. The, the the play that I remember most was him stopping a cross seam pass um, mm-hmm. at the side of the net. So um, another big play there. Bruce, let's move on to our conundrum. And tonight's conundrum is the new the high sticking call against Nugent Hopkins, um, which was clearly from the replays uh, committed by was it Demello that committed it? Yeah, high yeah. sticked his own yeah. guy. Yeah. You know, high stick to zone guy. It was. It's absolutely clear from the replay. Nonetheless, if just a little bit more than two minutes left in the game. Nuge goes off for oh, two man. minutes, and it's. <clears throat> it raises the question of how much video replay do you want? What do you want it for? Mm-hmm. And my inclination is to have as little of it as possible. Just as as just, I don't want it on offsides. Um, I agree. I and like I don't. I don't want it on. I'm. I, you know, because it's just, I don't know. And and it seems like the, the owners often benefit. I think the owners more often benefit than they get burnt on the offside thing because they seem to be quite adept at picking out every time it happens to them. Unless it's Kale McCurr. Yeah, unless it's Kale McCurr. But I don't, I just, I, I wish that would Going go away. a wrinkle in the space time continuum. I think obviously you need it on goals. It's mm-hmm. quite, it can be helpful on goals. Yeah. Other than that, I, I, I'd rather, then on a penalty like this, I'd rather just have the refs make a mistake and everybody live with it than mm-hmm. have video review on it. I'm not in favor of video review. I just I just think it's tedious and drags out the game. And I don't, I don't, they, I don't know. They just talked about this at the GM's meetings. This very scenario came up. High sticking and the other one's puck over glass. Uh, and the idea being that the team that's got the penalty called on them can challenge uh, but if they lose the challenge, then they're going to get a second penalty on top of the first one and have to go three on five. So they're very unlikely to challenge it unless they know they're right. Like Chris Knobloch knew he was right tonight. He was just looking at the ref saying, no, not what happened. And when you look at the replay, there's one obvious thing that stands out, and that is that Ryan Nugent Hopkins has white tape on his stick. And Dylan DeMello has black tape on his stick, and it's the black stick that smashes the Winnipeg guy in the face. And four zebras apparently couldn't tell black from white. It happens, Bruce. It, it sure happens. does. It, they're not intentionally getting that wrong. It was just a mis- it was a mistake. Yeah. Anyway, so, but, but even when they got together and talked to each other I know, about I thought, it, they couldn't. Anyway. I, if, yeah. the, if, the, if the Jets had scored there and won the game on a late power play goal and uh, – uh, I would have been a very surly customer during this podcast tonight. I used to watch the NBA a lot. I was a huge fan, and I and I haven't been in recent years. But I tuned into a playoff game this year just to see the I can't remember which team has this great center. I think Denver, and I wanted to see him play. And mm-hmm. I was just struck by how many reviews, video reviews, they were, and it was just horrible. It just was, it was wrecking things. I like that whole thing though, of if you, maybe it should always be this. You can call a video review, but mm-hmm. if you get it wrong, you get another penalty. Two men short. Yeah. Yeah. That I mean, would that's be, that's that, the penalty that, for, uh, for an incorrect challenge now, but when you, if you're challenging a penalty and you get it wrong, then the, 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 the penalty for that is another penalty. And now you're two men short for two minutes, right? It's not just two, two men short. It's. Are they going to do that on high sticking? Well, that's what they said. They give. They're, they're talking about it now. It still has to go through a couple of layers, but that was a. Yeah. It was a hot topic at the GM's meeting. Just was it last week? They were talking about this. So, I, I like, and I know, like, you want to get it right and you want to be fair, but I just mm-hmm. think uh, at, at some point it becomes you're taking. Yeah. You're t- even though it's very serious, like it's, yeah, people's livelihoods, and they're all very competitive people, and and you know, and, and the fans want. You it to get it right. It's like, are we not all just taking it too seriously with this endless video reviews? Is it's just it's, wow. it's just play the damn game. Well, ever since video got better and better, and technology has taken over, and it's like, I mean, the NHL is like, well, we have to do something with technology. What can we review? Well, we can review offsides. We can, you know, we can cut it paper thin, but but. Uh, uh, that's one thing we we can call, but we can't overrule a referee's decision, no matter how egregious a penalty call might be. No, we can't we can't look at that. And to me, it's like let's have a society where we 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 
you know, random crime continues to go on as random crime, but we crack down on every single citizen that goes one kilometer an hour over the speed limit because we can measure that. Yeah, so I'm not gonna. You get a big I'm fine. Not, I'm gonna get you into the speed trap. Don't get me going on this, Bruce. But yeah, one kilometer. I'm t- talking about a fine for one k over the over the speed limit. Like that's what it seems like. It's like such a such a slice, such a thin thin slice that they because uh, you can measure it and because it's you know you can mm-hmm. easily prove it in court. That's what you take to court because you can't prove someone, for instance, you know, changing lanes too much or dangerous driving. That's right, really right. difficult to change. Right. And that, yeah, it's that's really hard to to prove. But you can sure sh- show if someone's gone minutely over the buffer zone anyway. Mm-hmm. Such is life in Edmonton, Bruce. And mm-hmm. such is life. At in least the NHL. they killed the penalty, <clears throat> and then they won. Even if they lost in overtime, like, but they come out with zero points because the refs screwed up a, that you been know, been white horrible. tape for black tape. A new, I mean, new just stick is literally on the puck on the ice when Demello's stick comes smashing up into his teammate's face. Like, wasn't even close. Anyway. What's Take the two done. points and get out of Dodge. Yeah, well, they got some Nuge got his revenge when he set up that winning goal. There you go. Mm-hmm. Karma. Bruce, yes. what's the next game? Next game is Thursday at home. They're back home. I think it's the Kings, isn't it, next? I believe so. And then they have a Saturday afternoon game. Yeah, against, against the, Ducks. the Ducks. Yeah, there's not there's a break. Yeah. So not really, but uh yeah, it's uh yeah, yeah. The Kings Thursday night—that's a huge game because the Kings are coming on strong. Yeah. Then Saturday afternoon, then uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday next week. So it just keeps going, going high. Full steam ahead. If we're getting there, we're getting there. Yeah. Thanks for talking tonight, Bruce. All right. Thanks for listening, everyone. And in the meantime, and in between times, this has been another edition of the Cult of Hockey podcast.